Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Matt Wilson and I'm with Anardis USA. I'm our application specialist and my focus here is on microoxygenation. Today, we have uh, two presenters who I'll introduce in just a second. But first I wanna go over what uh, the agenda is. It's very basic and uh, straightforward. We're gonna do our introductions of our co-presenters. We're gonna touch on the application periods uh, throughout the winemaking process where uh, microoxygenation and oxygen use is employed. Then we're going to have uh, discussion points on each of those application periods. We're going to talk about the Inartis WinIQ system, and uh, then we will finish off with our questions and answers. So we have a good, uh, good opportunity here to talk with Kevin Yule. He's our production winemaker at the winery at Black Star Farms up in Northern Michigan in Sutton's Bay. It's a beautiful location up there. Uh, and Kevin focuses primarily on Pinot Noir and Cab Franc, as well as red wine blends. Uh, one of the, the reasons that we brought Kevin and Black Star Farms into this conversation is their uh, use of microoxygenation spans across multiple periods of application. And they, uh, they really utilize technology to their benefit throughout the entire process of winemaking. Um, what uh, we want to focus on primarily with his part of this is going to be color stability and tannage, tannin management. As when they're working with flash detente technology, uh, you're getting a lot of extraction. So I'd like to bring Kevin in here uh, just to kind of uh, you know talk about what they do best. And um, yeah, so Kevin. Thanks, Matt. Uh, again, my name is Kevin. I am in beautiful northern Michigan, and, and uh, the snow is actually almost all melted up here, which is unusual for March, but that's great. Hopefully, that will mean a long growing season. Um, then, that long growing season is a big part of why we try to use a lot of micro oxygenation. Um, we have a short growing season, and things don't always fully ripen up here, um, especially with Cab Franc. Um, you know, it's a late ripener for us here in Northern Michigan. So uh, color and um, ripeness are a big issue. So, you know, we got a flash de taunt to manage the unripe flavors um, as well um, to uh, get just better color. And then um, we've used the, um, the microox to be able to just stabilize color um, to, I'm not gonna get too much into science because I know I'll forget some key factor or not, but you know, the, the post uh, primary fermentation, the microox to help stabilize um, color before malolactic uh, is uh, a key for us to get deeper colored Pinot Noir, which um, probably many of us know can be notorious for not being very dark. So. Uh, that helps. And then the flash detente, as Matt alluded to, um, can be very, very extractive of tannins. So the microox later on can help make those tannins less hard, less um, aggressive. They're kind of chalky. Those, the process can just help make them um, a lot smoother. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, as we go through this conversation, uh, we're really going to touch on each of the application periods in more depth um, to kind of get an idea of how uh, how it's it's applied in a bunch of different regions. So our next presenter I want to introduce is uh, Spencer Gatlin. He's the winemaker at Inwood Estates uh, and Vineyards in Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, one of the things that they're very well known for is uh, low yield um, and also introducing uh, Tempranillo to the Southwest. Uh, the ways that they utilize the Microx primarily is also to deal with that green character uh, and to essentially in, uh, uh, help incorporate the flavors and aromas of oak. So Spencer, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, if you could give us a little bit about what you guys do best and uh, what your area of growing is like. Uh, yeah, so 
um, I were here in uh, in Texas, in Central Texas. Uh, we we manage vineyards uh, all over the state, actually, uh, in many different uh, growing air, uh, regions. But uh, primarily, uh, what we do uh, is utilize the micro rocks to mask green character. We're kind of the opposite of what um, uh, Kevin is doing up in Michigan because we have a very long growing season and uh, it's hot, it's dry. Um, but what we have found is certain varieties that um, have uh, thinner skins uh, tend to ripen. The skins will ripen exponentially faster than the polyphenols inside. And so what that does is it gives us a uh, it gives us uh, some underripe fruit, uh, you know, uh, flavor wise. And um, and so, yeah, the micro rocks uh, we found is uh you know, we implement it uh, post MLF and um, use uh, some of the in artist tannins to help uh, get rid of some of that uh, green characteristics. Um, you know, the the one way that we can we can naturally do it is by cutting our yields down. And but unfortunately, cutting yields to a very low uh, tonnage per acre, I'm talking about uh, maybe a half ton per acre uh, can cause um you know, it, it's uneconomical to farm vineyards that way. So uh, by, you know, uh, in, in a way that we have to increase our yields, you know, we uh, we then have to utilize the micro rocks to get rid of some of that green character. Perfect. Thank you, Spencer. So um, we also want to touch on the fact that we brought in both Spencer and Kevin uh, because they're coming from very different climates, very different growing uh, locations. And in the past, when we've spoken uh, with, you know, people in California, Oregon, Washington, uh, the Midwest, uh, the Central uh, Southwest, and then also on the East Coast, uh, everybody has different um, issues that they're trying to overcome, different winemaking, uh, you know, items that are important for them. But of all of these different items and you know short growing season high moisture high humidity uh extremely dry high ph um what we encounter is that everybody kind of tries to strive towards you know a few simple principles and those are the the primary um wine making stages that we're going to talk so uh progressing forward and as we go through we're going to get to each of the the different slides uh, and we'll go deeper into discussion and we'll talk more on uh, the unique winemaking aspects of each of uh, both Kevin and uh, Spencer. So first, I want to introduce um, the Anardis Wine IQ. And essentially, uh, from a very simplistic approach, we wanted to define how to apply to one single tank at the same at one time. Uh, but across all the different winemaking stages. So from fermentation, color stability, uh, into the maturation period, integrating of oak and tannins. So we have our micro program, our macro program, but the biggest uh, part is to introduce uh, the ability to control it remotely from a computer on any network uh, in the winery. So being able to remotely do um, the operation and not have to climb up the catwalk uh, that is the focus of this device right here. So let's talk about that first period that I just said, uh, the macro application, which also does introduce hyperoxidation. We're not going to touch on hyperoxidation today. Uh, however, uh, hyperoxidation is absolutely something that can be utilized in the juice prior to the fermentation uh, to help reduce uh, the catechins and uh, kind of bitterness in white wines and sparkling wines. Um, but fermentation application of oxygen is used highly throughout the world of fermentation. And what I have showing here is a brewery on the very top. It's used in cider production throughout the world. Uh, in Spain, uh, they utilize it uh, in cider production for all batches. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's a massive thing. Uh, white wine and also red wine. In white wine, you're going to be uh, ensuring a healthy uh, 
no uh, minimizing reduction, things of that sort. And in red wine, you're also going to be minorly stabilizing color and softening tannins at the same time. So in this period, I really wanna start with uh, bringing in Kevin and um, just kind of asking, you know, in your operation, you guys are using uh, flash deton as one of the items, but more importantly, how are you utilizing oxygen regardless of Microox application? How are you, you, you getting oxygen into your fermentation to really ensure healthy fermentation and low reduction? Yeah, so, um, so we have two different, you know, we do um, small ferments in, in um, like half ton bins, but then we also have tanks, um, you know, from anywhere three to eight ton fermenters. And for each of those, we do different, different things. So the small ones, we do punch downs and the bigger ones, we do pump overs. And um, I'll start with the pump overs because it's easier to get oxygen into those. So um, we do a, a, we have a cart with a screen on it. And so we then have the tank flow into the cart with as much oxygen in there as possible. Um, if we need to, we'll actually take an oxygen tank um, that we would get from a air gas and pump oxygen into the juice in, in the cart before pumping it back over the top. So we're just trying to introduce oxygen uh, in that way, just throughout the ferment. Um, and if it's a okay. stinky ferment, we'll uh, pump over for longer and trying to introduce more oxygen. And then for the punch down, Perfect. Uh, um, we, we will actually take that same oxygen tank uh, and uh, put, um, take like a racking wand to, and hook it up to that and put it at the bottom of the fermenter and, and just introduce oxygen that way. Okay, so it sounds like you guys are focusing mainly on the, the punch down technique and sump and screen. Um, are you utilizing any uh, in-tank aerators, uh, you know, the sprinkler style system? Um, are you doing large open top ferments that you're also doing punch downs with maybe a pneumatic press? No, we don't have the uh, pneumatic punch down device. Um, but okay. we do, if, it's, um, if we do are doing a longer fermenter, or sorry, longer pump over, we'll have a, a sprinkler system in the, in the top so we can walk away and, and um, not have to stand there for half hour. Perfect. Perfect. So really, I mean, the, the focus here is introducing that oxygen, which we all know uh, we want to do. Um, how about in white wine? How about in white tanks? Are you guys, you know, are you hitting it with oxygen through the, the bottom port? Um, are you sparging it in? Uh, how, how do you do it in uh, for your white wines? Yeah, so we'll do, um, like you said, sparging it in. Um, we'll, we'll get a trickle going on. Um, sometimes we'll actually set up our, our microox system at that point and use the, the, the sparging stone that comes with that um, and um, put it at a low rate. Um, actually, no, we'll do, for that, sorry. For that part of the fermentation, we'll do a macroox cut a rate of three grams per liter per day. Um, to try and get more oxygen into it, um, just to keep that sure. the yeast yeast healthy. Yeah, because I mean, and I'm I want to bring Spencer in on this too. Uh, I mean, one of the the things that, of course, Northern Michigan, especially uh, winter time, is kind of cold. I'm sure that the fermentations go for a long period of time on your white wines, um, regardless of temperature control or not. The cellar temperature. I mean, when I was up there in the winter some of them were having a hard time getting over 50. So, you know, uh, you, you see that a, a 20 to 40 day fermentation, adding that oxygen really can help uh, during the fermentation, especially if it can be dosed into a closed tank. And to bring Spencer in on this, uh, how about you? I mean, are you, are you doing the same things that Kevin is on your red wine fermentations, doing the sump and screen, doing pun punch downs and pump overs? Um, are you doing, uh, you know, any other type of uh, introduction of oxygen? Uh, yeah, we well, uh, you know, we we do all of our uh, fermentation in in the macro bins. So uh, just like Kevin does, uh, but we um, we don't do any tank fermentation. We found, you know, in our experience that we get uh, much better extraction and 
uh, higher quality. It's, uh, you know, by doing it in the macro bins, it's also easier to manage uh, the smaller fermentations, you know, without minimizing uh, or, or while minimizing risk, <laughs> excuse me, risk. Um, but uh, occasionally we do uh, do some macro ox um, by just uh, just a regular oxygen tank and a sparging stone. And we'll put it in there and uh, let it break up the cap. Um, and we have found the added benefits, but uh, for the most part, uh, just doing regular hand punch downs, uh, seems to feed enough oxygen into the, um, uh, into the macro bins to keep the fermentations healthy. Our fermentations do run hot and fast. Um, and there are some advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, but, uh, is <laughs> the, an, an advantage would be that it, uh, we can kind of burn and churn our fermentations quicker uh, to, since we do all macro bin fermentations, you know, space is a huge issue, um, space in the winery. Uh, but uh, we do, we do like the benefit of the higher rate of extraction. Um, and it, overall, we think it does produce a higher quality wine. Perfect. Thanks, Spencer. Um, yep. And so uh, in white wines, uh, what's recommended as a very, uh, you know, user friendly way to go about this is one to three milligrams per liter per day at the one third sugar mark. So uh, around the same time that you add your nutrients. Uh, so when you're adding your Nutrifirm, you know, advance, uh, hit it with a little bit of uh, oxygen uh, sparged in. And then again at that halfway mark and by hitting it with uh, the two oxygen uh, for white wines, uh, you're really helping ensure that yeast health. Um, red wines, you can go with a higher amount. Uh, I mean, sometimes all the way up to 10 milligrams per liter per day. Uh, it just really depends on what you're trying to achieve. But the real key factor is during fermentation, oxygen additions are used to ensure uh, good yeast health, improve the mouthfeel uh, as the primary focus because the yeast consumes the oxygen in uh, very quickly. Um, some of the some of the um, data shows that it can be in as little as two hours. So even a high addition rate, not, uh, not too much of an issue. Um, and uh, Neil, uh, Kevin was talking about uh, during the fermentation, um, not, uh, not in the juice phase. I, I believe that's what your question is. Okay, so um, before I leave this slide, if, uh, as, as we continue, Please toss anything in the chat because we do want to make sure that uh, your your use is also uh, in here. Okay, so the next key stage of um, utilizing oxygen is going to be in color stability. And this is done post-alcoholic fermentation, pre-ML. And so we typically try to delay that ML, whether it's the use of our Stab Micro, which is a ketosan-based um, agent, or through lysozyme is typically used. Uh, but essentially, as soon as um, the fermentation ends and there's no SO2 added, we want to start working with tannins or oak, but with tannins to stabilize the color. This is extremely important, as Kevin mentioned earlier uh, in their Pinot Noir. Um, it's extremely important in a lot of other wines. I mean, I'm showing here in this, uh, this photo on the right-hand side the unstable color, um, I believe, of a petite or a Syrah, but um, this can be used uh, to stabilize color in very hard to stabilize wines as well, such as rosés. So on this, I wanna bring Kevin right back in, um, especially as he has a lot of experience with that Pinot Noir um, and uh, Cab Franc and trying to stabilize the color in those. So, we at the you know black star has been around for a very long time um 20 plus years and some of our early pinots had a hard time with color stability um and then um at some point we started using utilizing micro ox post primary fermentation um about i don't know we're i think we're using roughly three grams per liter per day um, or milligrams, sorry, um, of oxygen at that point. Uh, and we've noticed that not only is the color better, but um, when we go into, we do malolactic in barrel 
and we can actually keep the wine in barrel for longer um, post malolactic. So we're not racking immediately. Um, that that depends upon rot issues, um, which is a different topic. Um, so then we can get actually the lees from from the fermentation um, to help build up mouthfeel. Um, before um, we were having to rack, um, and the and because the leaves were were beginning to strip color a little bit. So now with better color, we can uh, keep the wine on leaves and getting better mouthfeel. So our overall wine quality has been able to improve because of the use of micro rocks at at this point. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And have you guys? Uh, I mean, if you could give it a percentage. Um, kind of basis is there like an increase that you've seen um that is definitive i mean you could look at a, say a 2016 pinot noir versus a 2017 pinot where you were able to stabilize that color more are, are we talking the difference between something that's relatively translucent and kind of uh, for lack of a better word pinot colored or are you looking at something that has a little bit more of a, a darker character you know like a syrah it, well I wish we could say we could get Syrah type color up here. Um, <laughs> we, we can't in our Pinots, um, but no, we're talking about a maybe um, a really a darker colored Pinot um, where before it was, it was almost like a rosé um, sort of coloring. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, from the California side and then up the West coast, uh, you know, Pinot Noir is something that since it's grown in so many different areas, uh, the color varies dramatically. And so there's always tricks to try to get more and more and more color. Um, using the flash to taunt, are you seeing a dramatic increase of that color? Yeah. So, you know, there was a good, we have a good example, um, from 2018, 2018 was, um, a year with a lot of rain at harvest. So we, for our Cab Franc, we wanted to um, use our flash to taunt, to help deal with all the, the rot that was developing. Cause that's one of the great things is it um, flash to taunt heats it up and, and kind of kills the rot off. So it, it's a very useful tool. Um, unfortunately, one day during harvest, it, uh, the, our flash to taunt stopped working. Uh, so it needed to be fixed. And, but in that one day we had already picked up um, some Cab Franc. So we had uh, Cab Franc that had been through the flash to taunt and some Cab Franc that hadn't. And the difference in color was pretty dramatic. Um, so the flash to taunt, you know, heats it up, vacuum, um, cooling, then ruptures and releases all the anthocyanins in the skins. And then um, through the, through the micro rocks right after post fermentation, really helped set that up. And, and in the one that didn't go through the flash to taunt because it was down, the color on that was just pink. You know, it was almost like rosé. Um, the, the rot had really taken out um, a lot of the color. Um, we, you know, we tried to, we did all the things to do with um, protocols with rotten fruit, you know, press early, sorting, um, not over extracting it. Um, just trying to really make sure um, the wine doesn't age quicker than it needs to. And, you know, there was probably a little bit of slight browning just because it was pretty extensive. Um, but the flash helps deal with that. Sure. The Microox helped uh, set that color pretty well. So that when we ended up blending those wines together, the wine was still a pretty dark red um, that you would hope for in a Cab Franc. Awesome. Um, and so, I mean, when we talk about the chemical reactions that are happening, it's the tannins that are react or not reacting, but, you know, uh, binding onto the anthocyanin through uh, ethanol that is oxidized acetaldehyde, creating stable color, which is condensing that color. Um, but you have to have the three components available. So you need to have tannin, which in that Cab Franc's case, uh, the flash to taunt actually extracts the tannin uh, to create, you know, a higher tannin content, um, as well as the color. And then if you have that oxygen to facilitate that uh, condensing, now all of a sudden you have 
great color that is stable. And it's a very key aspect of, you know, making a lot of different wines, especially uh, post uh, the alcohol fermentation prior to the ML. It's a very tight window. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it does also soften the aggressive tannins um, and uh, not uh, it, it's it's a big part of what happens right then. But, you know, the aging process also does that as well. And we'll go on to that next. Uh, before I do go forward, uh, Spencer, did you have anything to add to this? And um, otherwise, we will go on to the next slide. I'll take that as no, Spencer. Oh, I, I, no, I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, man. Um, okay, so on to uh, the next step. So now you've done your fermentation, your color stability. We've gone through ML. Now we're looking at managing the the tannins. Uh, this, of course, is especially uh, you know dominant in high tannin varieties, uh, but maybe also uh, you have. Um, you know, a higher extraction or something of that sort, maybe your fermentation got out of hand a little bit and the tannins are a little aggressive. So this is an important step for polymerizing those tannins, creating long chains, mo chain molecules, uh, which in the mouth is softer, but it also does help facilitate uh, kind of the precipitation of, um, of tannin. So you're getting an increased mouthfeel and a softening due to dropping out of, uh, of the tannins. And this is typically done over the course of time, uh, one to three milligrams per liter per month. Some people go all the way up to five uh, milligrams per liter per month. Uh, it really is kind of facility-based and based on the wine that you're making as well. But tannin management is a big portion of this. Kevin actually touched on it already. Uh, if, um, but let's, let's bring both Kevin and Spencer in, uh, just to, I mean, really elaborate on their experience with the tannin softening, how it's changed. Um, I know that uh, we'll, we'll start with Kevin real fast. Uh, you did have um, the uh, one of your lots that you had a very high tannin amount. And you found that uh, by doing one to three milligrams per liter per month, uh, you were able to soften that tannin. Can you can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah. So the what you're referring to um, when we had, um, exchanged through email, I was talking about uh, a flash to taunt lot. So you know we get great color, but we also extract a lot of tannins at that at that point. And those tannins um, post ML even um, are very, can be very chalky. Um, that's the best term I have for it. But it you know, it's not the sort of silky tannins that you want in a finished wine. So we, you know, I, I, I contacted um, Tyler, who's our, an artist rep, and we got to chatting. Um, and he, he suggested, why don't I just try microoxing it um, and see what happens? And so we put that wine into tank from barrel and we hit it at a slightly higher rate um, on the microox scale, probably that three milligrams per liter per month and let, and let it sit. And after um, even just a week, we could already tell that those tannins were beginning to uh, become smoother. You know, they were definitely moved out of that chalkiness to something where we thought, okay, um, this one lot will be able to blend with some other Cap Franc we have and make a better wine. And uh, you were saying that, I mean, the difference in, in that especially was the fact that you were able to see that transition over the course of months where, you know, in previous years or previous lots, you had seen that the transition took, you know, years and not just months. So you were able to facilitate that, that change and that polymerization in a much shorter period so that you weren't having to wait on a wine to be ready as long. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So we, so we, yeah, we had, I contacted Tyler originally because of, um, of the previous wine that even after two years in barrel was still practically unapproachable from a uh, tannin standpoint, uh, another flash lot. Um, just, it was chalky, it was just not pleasurable. So we knew we needed to try something different and that's 
what we tried and it's so far it's working out pretty well we'll see how it it ages still you know this is a 2020 wine so it's just a young baby but already it, it seems to be yeah. very promising the um okay if i may jump in um the only thing yeah I please would, do please. okay uh, sorry, a little bit of delay. Um, the only thing I would add to that is uh, that Kevin is absolutely right. Uh, you know, um, we we have flashed some wine in the past, and uh, we flashed some wine in 2017, and uh, we did not utilize Microrox, uh, you know, uh, post uh, post MLF uh, on that wine, and uh, it took until. Uh, about a month ago before we finally pulled that wine out of barrels because the tannins were so sharp and so aggressive that we, uh, the wine was just not ready. So, um, you know, the advantage of, of using the micro rocks is that you don't have to put the wine in wood for, you know, 36, 39 months or whatever it was. I mean, it, it was, it was a really long waiting process. And of course, you know, you lose time, you lose money, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of advantages to speeding that up, uh, you know, when you have harsh tannins. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, a lot of times, you know, people are talking about how Microox is meant for like extremely fast to market wines and such, but it's, I mean, yes, it can help facilitate that, but it's, it's a tool for your winery to utilize as you need. I mean, if you have a wine that's going to go 36 months and the tannins are un, unbearable or unmanageable, like hit it for a month, put it back in the barrel, keep it aging just use it as a way to slowly but surely bring that wine to a point that you are happy with and you're able to, you know, get that wine to market the way you intended. Yeah, I think, uh, um, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Spencer. Oh, well, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, philosophically, we were always somewhat opposed to micro rocks because we thought that it was kind of a shortcut to get want to rush wine to market, uh, faster. And, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it, when used correctly, it is a tool and why not utilize all the tools that are available to you? Um, you don't necessarily have to go, you know, to one extreme or the other. You can, you can uh, use it with nuance. Precisely. Well said, well said. Um, and so continuing that same trend of tannin management, we're going to go to oak integration and oak integration is more than just integrating, you know, uh, the, the flavor and aroma and maybe the texture that you're going to get from oak. I mean, oak has so many different compounds into it. Um, it's really important to also understand that in tank aging with chips or with staves or with, you know, chunks, you get a different flavor profile with each application. There's a certain amount of oxygen that is in the oak that actually is expressed into the wine. So there's different amounts of time that you can uh, utilize a uh, the the integration option. If you're going for long term, um, it's something that might take six to eight months in tank. But just as we talked about before, you can also take and apply your wine into the barrel, take it out, make your blend, hit it with some microox to really kind of integrate those flavors even more, and then put it back into barrel for continued aging, perhaps in neutral barrels rather than more of a, a, a higher percentage of new oak. And so the oak integration period, uh, prior to our last slide, which is going to talk on green characters, but the oak integration period um, is really important as the maturation and the refining period uh, that will incorporate all the flavors that you're getting, as well as uh, slowly but surely, you know, softening and improving the structure and body of the wine. Uh, this, again, is typically done at that one to three milligrams per month um, and then evaluated as needed. But it's important to also recognize, and in previous uh, webinars, we've actually talked about this more, is that it's, it's more important to understand your application period and what is traditional for your winery based on your oak use and profile. So if you're using a higher percentage of American oak or Hungarian oak or neutral barrels or French barrels, uh, there's different amounts of oxygen ingress that you're going to get and oxygen transfer rates. And in all the studies that uh, are out there, it's shown that the amount of oxygen transferred through the barrel staves, uh, the older the barrel typically becomes less. So if you have a higher percentage of neutral barrels, 
it's important to you know do a, a short calculation and find out how much oxygen your facility is typically using. For some people, it's as little as you know 0.7 milligrams per month uh, per liter per month. For others, it's five milligrams per liter per month. So this is a, a good opportunity to refine the wine and incorporate those oak uh, flavors. And guys, if I uh, if you would like to touch on this, I know that I mean obviously oak is a big part of all of our you know winemaking uh, throughout the entire process, but uh, I mean, oak integration can be early in the process. Uh, it can be later in the process. You can add flavor. You can, you know, bring out new oak later uh, so that you can get a little bit more of kind of a, a vanilla or coconut. Um, so let's start with Spencer and uh, just say, how has your uh, facility utilized its microox in the oak uh, integration? Uh, you know, typically our, uh, the, Oak integration that we do is done uh, through um, through through barrel aging. Um, I, I'll we have started to use some of Inartis's oak chips uh, just uh, post post pressing right away. I mean, if if the wine goes into a tank, you know, we'll uh, we'll hit it with some oak chips to try to get some uh, early oak integration because uh, we found that that's when it's the most effective. There's no question. Um, but uh, as far as when our microox goes, um, we we typically don't use it for oak integration. So I'll I'll yield to Kevin and let him talk about that. Perfect. Um, and uh, while we wait for Kevin to come on, uh, James has asked how much O2 does older oak allow into wine. Um, so a neutral barrel uh, is anywhere between eight to twelve milligrams per year, uh, milligrams per liter per year. So that boils down to about one uh, point, point, 0 0.8 to uh, one milligram per liter per month. And I mean, it's an average and it depends on the barrel. It depends on the, uh, the uh, grain that you have, where it comes from. It depends on a lot of things, but like a nice round number is about one milligram per liter per month. And then uh, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so um, we... When we do oak in tanks, um, it, it's generally used as a almost like a finishing oak. So we'll put um, for our our a red blend called our Red House Red, which is just a standard red table wine. Um, we'll we'll blend that up and we'll taste it and be like, okay. Generally, we'll throw some American oak chips into the tank, and th that might sit in there for a couple months and and. It, at times it can become reductive. And so we'll, we'll throw microox in there to, to prevent that. And, and that will help also um, soften those uh, American oak uh, tannins and flavor profiles. You know, imagine just sticking wine in American, sorry, excuse me, American oak barrel in that first month, it's just not very pleasant. But as, as you know, you age it for longer, um, say a year and those that, Oak integrates well in a tank when we want to bottle that month that wine in about a month. Yeah, we'll use uh, microox to help make that American oak a lot smoother, so then we can bottle it and get it to market sooner. And that's that's actually a really that's a good segue, uh, Kevin, because uh, microox as a refining tool just before uh, bottling is a is a really big one. Um, I mean, there's a lot of side benefits that go throughout, I mean, some clarification, uh, you know, your color stability and things of that sort. But the refining period of applying microox, you know, a month to two months prior, uh, maybe waking it up a little bit out from, you know, it's time in the barrels or in a tank, uh, refreshing, uh, you can always refine it with a little bit of tannin to make the fruit pop. Uh, as Kevin said, a little bit of oak to give it a little bit more depth. And the integration is relatively short maybe two to four weeks. And then you can, you know, go down the bottling path of all your filtration and getting, getting it in the packaging. So uh, that's a great point, Kevin. And thanks for pointing that out. Um, okay. So last uh, big slide here that we really want to talk on is overcoming green uh, flavors. And this could also from a very small point, uh, be um, dealing with uh, non-vinifera flavors. 
to a lesser extent though, because those are those are very very unique. But uh, overcoming green flavors is a big point here, and it's through the use specifically of oak and tannin and or tannin in combination with microox, because what you're trying to do is overcome those green flavors and to a point that you are masking them uh, and they will not reappear later. So underripe Merlot, underripe Cab Franc, um, underripe Cab Sauv, others as well, but you know the known uh, uh, grapes that always have trouble with being underripe. It's important to, especially if you're trying to hit for a very specific alcohol content, uh, to kind of have some tools in the background that you can help overcome that. And I want to bring uh, Spencer into this because he specifically has a really good story about um, a 2019 vintage wine that he was able to uh, really, really work on. So Spencer, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll get to that in just a second. But yeah, this is definitely the uh, area where we've had the most benefit from using micro rocks. Um, you would think uh, in Texas, you know, it being hot and dry that we wouldn't deal with under ripeness. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we we have we do grow some thin skin varieties and our you know, our thinking was is that, OK, well, we'll we'll get them to ripen faster and uh, then we can pull them off the vine before we have any uh, threat of rain because believe it or not, we do um, uh, we do get get rain in harvest here. But uh, especially with Tanit and uh, Petite Syrah, uh, we found that the skins were ripening so fast that the grapes, you know, were losing all their uh, integrity um, on the vine that we were having to harvest them. But then uh, the juice inside was uh, extremely underripe. And I'm mean, staring at this picture of the green bell pepper. I mean, it might even be worse than green bell pepper. So, um, you know, what we found is that, you know, uh, post MLF, what we'll do is uh, we'll leave it in tanks, you know, we'll press into tanks. MLF into tank um, and then we'll in the tank and then, you know, start the micro rocks right away. Um, the, uh, the, an artist tan max nature is a fantastic tannin that uh, binds to the uh, green characteristics and lets them fall out of the wine. Um, typically a program might last four to six weeks uh, just depending on how green the wine is. Um, you know, some green can be desirable, but uh, you know, most of it we're talking like we're not talking pyrazines. We're talking like C six compounds that are just you know offensive to everything. Um, but uh, yeah, above four to six weeks typically with the micro rocks. Um, and like the slide says, we usually hit around three milligrams per liter per month. Um, and uh, you know, just doing sensory analysis like every so every other day, you know, you'll uh, you'll you really see it uh, quickly go away. Um, there is a question down here about free SO two during during and after micro rocks. Uh, we try to keep it, everything below uh, like twenty five parts per million, just to uh, just to make sure that the SO that the wine doesn't go VA or anything. But then the SO two can, uh, but then the micro rocks can still have uh, enough. Uh, ability to work without too much, uh, free salt, free SO2. Yep. Um, I, I second that hundred percent. In fact, uh, what we, uh, what we see at all the different facilities that are using microox, um, is, you know, they want that 30 PPM, but the microox itself is a reaction device. I mean, all we're doing is creating oxygen reactions in the wine and SO2, of course, what is it there for? It's to react with the oxygen. So uh, since the oxygen is supposed to be dissolving into the wine and not necessarily specifically driving at a reaction with the SO2, it normalizes at about that 20 to 25 range. Um, so just as Spencer said, if it starts to drop below 20, uh, you got to hit it back up and you can get it all the way up to about 30. But if you apply more than 30, the oxygen just gets re reacted on with the SO2 pretty quickly and it drops right back down to about 25. So uh, it is something that you do want to monitor, uh, you know, at least weekly, uh, bi-weekly, if you're really comfortable with the, the, um, the process. Um, and monitoring uh, the DO is important. However, it's also really important to understand that uh, applying microox, you're not anticipating an increase of DO. If you are getting an increase of DO, you're adding too much because it's not reacting with the the uh, compounds that you're looking for, such as tannins, oak, and uh, you know color. 
So uh, an uh, increase of DO is not something that you're looking for. And go ahead, Spencer. Oh, well, I was going to add one more thing about uh, another great use for microrocks. And this is not just, you mentioned my my 2019 vintage. We we actually, it was a cool, slightly cooler year. Uh, so we were dealing with underripeness. So we had green in some of our, uh, it's our, our last Cabernet uh, clone seven is our, is our latest ripening clone. And uh, you know, it, uh, it, so we, we were dealing with some green, then we got hit with rain. And uh, so when we had to pull the fruit in, I mean, it was severely damaged and uh, the, the sulfur compounds in it were unbearable. And um, so we hit it with, uh, we actually took it out of barrels um, and hit it with uh, the tan max nature and the tan SLI. The tan SLI really helps uh, with the micro rocks and it removes any any rotten egg, any H2S, anything that you have uh, in your wine. And um, so actually uh, it pr pretty much just saved, you know, uh, 12 barrels of wine that we use uh, uh, very um, for, for some of our highest end stuff. And so it actually saved that wine and uh, it's coming out of barrel soon and it's uh, it's in great shape. Great. Thanks, Spencer. Um, Kevin, do you have uh Anything that you'd like to add on uh, the the green character and overcoming that? You know, um, here in northern Michigan, you you touched on this earlier, Matt, about non vinifera. So you know, I proudly, well, maybe this is the first time I've ever said that. Proudly make <laughs> hybrid, hybrid wines, um, and the reason I say that is because. Um, they've come a long way. So the, you know, there's a newer one called Marquette that is actually. Uh, a really high quality hybrid that's, I don't know, 10, 15 years old at this point. Um, and when I first started in winemaking, that was not available. And there's some earlier, older hybrids that are just not as good. Um, but one of the things that we find um, is that that hybrid character um, often goes hand in hand with reductive characters as well. So, um, even as the wine ages, it can still just seem like there's a muted fruit. Um, and, and then, um, and kind of that hybridy flavor. So Hycorox, um, at that point, um, right after, right after primary, uh, sorry, right after malolactic, and while it's aging in tank, um, just helps um, bring out more of that fruit that, that customers want. Um, maybe with a little bit of oak, not always, because one of our one of our products uh, is is geared towards um, customers that want fruity wine but not oaky wine. Um, and so the that microox just helps bring out fruit that otherwise might not be there. Um, you know, flash to taunt actually has been a really great thing for hybrids as well um, to help bring out some other fruit characteristics. Um, interestingly, hybrids, we don't worry about tannins because there's the science around that is not clear, but there's something going on with hybrids that take up tannins. So uh, even if we were to add tannins uh, during primary fermentation, there's something going on where those all get absorbed and then precipitate out. So don't worry about tannin management as much, but that, that hybrid flavor um, definitely helps with microox quite a bit. So then we get more primary fruit characters that uh, help make that wine sell um, when it gets to the tasting room. Awesome. Um, so green flavors, I mean, they, they exist everywhere. Uh, cooler years in any environment and uh, I mean, shorter growing seasons, maybe a rain making you pick earlier. Maybe it's just the, the alcohol content that you're trying to make. So, I mean, green flavors, easy to kind of work with uh, utilizing the micro rocks. Um, we touched on, uh, and we just have a couple last things here and then we're going to Q and A, but we touched on, uh, you know, the, the aspect of how does the, the wine change over time? Um, always, you know, throughout the entire uh, process, do sensory, uh, do as much analysis as you can. Uh, if nothing else, do free SO2 and VA as well as sensory. Uh, but then taste and, uh, and track, because there's a key point that um, when you get to it, that's the harmonization period, that you get to essentially the perfection of what the wine probably will be 
prior to going over a bit of a hill. And once you get over that hill, you start to get the oxidative flavors that come out. You start to get uh, kind of dry, harsher tannins. And the closest way that I can describe it outside, uh, especially on the West Coast here, is similar to um, just like the, the kind of uh, gritty ashtray that uh, you can get in the back of the throat. So it's it can go across the entire mouth, but they are not supple and comprehensive. They're not hitting the front, the sides, uh, the top of the mouth, and the back of the palate. So they uh, they they have a nice period here that you really want to kind of aim for. So dealing with reduction, it's great. Uh, dealing with fermentation aromas, it works very well. And increasing complexity as well as softening tannins and uh, improving the mouthfeel. Um, so we're uh, just going to touch one more time on that slide that I showed earlier, just to reiterate the fact that uh, the Microx devices, they're easy, they're simple to set up, single tank application. Uh, they have multiple programs that you can utilize and able to be controlled uh, throughout the entire seller on any of the network uh, connections, computer, as well as on board. We're going to go into our um, Q&A next. Uh, but uh, please ask any questions. Please tell us about your uh, specific uh, protocols and how you're utilizing oxygen throughout the entire process uh, because there's a lot of information out there and we have these two guys here uh, to really kind of help touch on that. If you can, please uh, look back at our other um, webinars that we've done in the past. They are so much more uh, full of the theory and the science behind uh, rather than the practical use like hey i have to use it for three days that's what our time is so um, please take a, a peek at those they're available on our website at anartist.com uh, check it out under the videos and webinars i uh, really want to thank both spencer and kevin uh, for their time we're ready to go into the q a uh, and answer any of the questions that you guys have so what we're going to do is we're going to change it over to a q a um, format here and if you can, in the chat box, there's going to be an option for that question mark or a comment. If you can click the question mark for a uh, question, uh, that would help me uh, be able to present them up here. And Kevin and uh, Spencer, go ahead and uh, click on the mics. We're gonna talk about uh, the different questions here. So um, we already answered it earlier, but uh, we're gonna start with uh, James's question. And let's see here, let me click the right button. Is it this one? It's not that one. It's this one. It's not that one. It's this show question list. This one, there we go. James asked, uh, how much oxygen do older barrels um, allow into wine? Uh, the answer to that typically uh, from a very average amount is about one milligram per liter per month. Uh, newer barrels, are typically about two milligrams per liter per month, unless they are a very specific uh, type, which can allow up to three milligrams per liter per month. Um, but if you're using 20% new oak and 80% older oak, I would really emphasize the fact that one milligram per liter per month up to two milligrams per liter per month is kind of the, uh, the amount that a lot of people will use, especially until they are much more confident with the system. Uh, we're gonna just, uh, go forward to the next one, because these are already uh, questions we've answered. Uh, but I do want to get Kevin's input on this guy for SO2, uh, considerations for managing free SO2 uh, during and after Microx. It's that uh, the if you're going to start um, for color management, uh, no SO2, and then leading into ML, that way the ML also is going to be good uh, and have a successful fermentation and not stall out. Uh, but after ML, when you go into tannin management, oak integration, maturation, um, 25 to 30 ppm is kind of the nice golden number to aim for. Uh, and then that can always be, uh, it's going to slowly but surely reduce as Microx happens. Kevin, what do you guys uh, uh, use up there? So when I have Microx going, um, I will just measure our SO2 once a week, once every other week, depending on on what number I got on the previous week um, and whatever I'm comfortable with, um, you know, if it starts getting low, yeah, then I'll add SO2. But 
Um, I don't have the ability to measure dissolved oxygen, um, so I can't really answer that part of the question. But, um, you know, we have lower pHs, so um, I don't need to add as much SO2. Um, so, yeah, we, we're, we're generally in that 20 to 30 range when um, doing microoxygen tank. Perfect. Um, just to touch on DO one more time, uh, I mean, it depends on the amount of DO that you do have, but with proper, you know, microox reactions happening, you're not going to get an increase of DO. Uh, and with proper SO2 management, DO should not be too big of an issue. Uh, we really recommend doing this in a closed tank as much as possible, uh, variable capacity or, uh, you know, uh, synthetic tanks that are not going to be impermeable. Uh, are also adding oxygen. So that is a big point. And then at bottling, uh, white wines, we uh, here at Anartis recommend around uh, point, uh, 0.5 to 0.6 ppm. Uh, lower preferable, but 0.5 to 0.6 at the kind of the high end. Um, and then uh, 0.8 to point or to one on red wines, kind of depends on the aging. Uh, if you go above one, it's kind of a sticky sticky slope or slippery slope. So I wouldn't go that, that far. Um, Spencer, anything to add on DO? Uh, no, um, we like it, like you said, uh, you know, it's, it's microox called microox for a reason. So, you know, if the oxygen is reacting correctly, then you shouldn't have uh, any issues with dissolved oxygen. Perfect. Well said. Uh, Christine asks, uh, when using, uh, the microox to mask green flavor and soften flavors, what does this do to some of the more subtle aromas and flavors? Are there any undesirable outcomes? Um, I'll start with Spencer and then we'll go to Kevin. Uh, you know, typically when we're trying to get rid of the green flavor, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of our, our main focus. So, uh, you know, as long as we can get that away, then actually I would say that it uh, brings out the more subtle aromas and flavors. Um, what you're left with is a definitely a much more fruit forward wine and, uh, something that's much more saleable. Um, and then, you know, by, by putting it in oak, uh, right after, you know, you, uh, uh, the, the continued micro rocks from the barrel aging, you know, uh, uh, the old school micro rocks, um, uh, will actually bring out your more subtle aromas and flavors. So, uh, no, we have not had any undesirable outcomes yet. Um, and so hopefully we can continue to not have those. Thanks. And Kevin? Um, I, you know, we taste, when we're microoxing, we're tasting every day. Um, and we, just, we taste until we like what we taste. So I, I guess I really haven't focused much on the more subtle flavors um, because we are going from a wine that we don't really like to a wine that we like better. So uh, maybe it is having those more subtle flavors become more primary um yeah that's i guess yeah it's something more no, i mean I, th I think both you guys are really touching on it correctly is that if there are green flavors that we're trying to um you know overcome uh some of the more subtle flavors uh sadly are probably going to get lost and it's kind of like treating h2s with copper you clean up the h2s you lose some of the other flavors is it i mean you have to pick your poison on which one you want to go for. Uh, so let's see here. Going on to the next question, Neil is asking, uh, hey, Kevin's use was pre or post. Uh, this was very specific. I think this is going to be a hard question for us to kind of hit back on, but it was the use of um, oxygen during uh, fermentation, I believe. So like pre-fermentation, is that what that? Yeah, refers? I mean, that's that's how I take it. Um, are you using oxygen in the juice phase, I guess? No, no, we're doing it only once we get into fermentation. Um, I mean, we may not add SO2 if the fruit's clean at the, at the crusher or at the press and kind of let a natural oxidation happen there, but we're not introducing anything like hyperoxygenation. Okay, okay. Um, so then let's, uh, let's go on to the next. Uh, how crucial is the timing of MOX application post-alcoholic fermentation, but before the end of ML? Are the stabilization effects reduced if you apply the same rates after ML was complete? 
So uh, this is a fun question that uh, I like to answer because the earlier you can do anything, the better. In addition to the period between alcoholic fermentation and ML is, kind, is, is a golden period. You have no SO2. So all the reactions that are happening are like doubling down on everything. And you don't have the, the ML uh, present. So you're not gonna get uh, any worry about like a, a VA or you know, off aromas or flavors. The stabilization after, if it has not been completed in that period. Um, and I went to a presentation a few years back that uh, a larger um, winery in the central area of California was saying they don't ever even get the opportunity for that seven day window because their fermentations are so fast, so furious that they have to do all their stabilization afterwards. And it's less effective and less efficient, but they're still getting the benefit of the addition of tannins and uh, microx to stabilize as much color as possible. Again, that golden window, if you miss it, uh, definitely there are, um, there are other opportunities to still stabilize color throughout the entire maturation process. Uh, it's just, it's less effective at the, the real large uh, impact. All right, uh, Kara has asked if uh, we have any other webinars or information on microox on white wines um, and have Kevin and Spencer uh, tried mox on whites. So I'll let you guys answer this first and then I'll touch on whether or not we have uh, info. So let's start with um, Spencer. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, we do we don't we don't mox any white wines um, just because the only white wine we make is Chardonnay and we try to keep it as crisp as possible. Good answer. Um, for our white wines, it will have a during primary fermentation um, just to introduce oxygen into the ferment. Um, but after that, um, we don't generally micro ox our white wines. Okay. Um, and, uh, so as far as our webinars go, our webinars, uh, they do not focus on red or white, uh, specifically. However, you know, when you touch on something like Oak integration that can be done on whites and rosés, uh, color stability on uh, rosés and color stability on whites. Uh, it's just, it's done in a different way. I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you, Kara, um, and go more in depth on that because the, the, the points are much more uh, specific to when you want to do it. Fermentation is the biggest benefit though. And uh, the, uh, the application I was talking about in Spain, they do one to three milligrams per liter per day uh, for three to seven days, uh, depending on the fermentation temperature and uh, speed. Uh, that's the biggest benefit outside of hyperoxidation on uh, whites that have uh, higher green character or bitterness um, and uh, color instabilities. But also you can integrate oak, especially on any oaked wines, Chardonnay, Rieslings, uh, you know, things of that sort, so that you can really, uh, it, it's going to be a shorter period though, because the protective, excuse me, protective qualities of anthocyanin and tannin content are much less. So it needs a much more refined approach. It's definitely possible. And I'd be more than happy to talk to you more about that. Um, so I see a couple more questions. Let me see if I can get them up here. Here we go. Uh, James has said, uh, we barrel ferment shard in mass and have tried hyperox before putting juice in barrels and saw no difference. In lots where oak wasn't very integrated, microox treatments of one milligram per liter per month did improve the oak integration for us. Perfect. Uh, right, kind of in line. The Chardonnay, my understanding is that it's not going to be uh, benefited so much on the hyperox as like a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and uh, outside of if you are going into sparkling wine. In sparkling, a lot of the hyperox really deals with uh, you know, the characters that are going to, for lack of a better wine, if sparkling wine is compared to a vodka, it's supposed to be clean, clear, lacking off aromas, lacking off flavors. It's the way to get rid of as many of those as possible in a very short period of time. 
um, color stability as well, because it does uh, work on those catechins. And let's see here. Uh, so as a comment, uh, we see thanks for inviting guests from the middle of the country, Spencer and Kevin, that would be you guys. So uh, I do appreciate you guys joining. We've gone a little bit over in time right now. Uh, if there are any other questions, um, I do uh, recommend putting them in right now. But otherwise, we are. Uh, I'm going to say thank you very much to Spencer. Uh, your your knowledge and uh, input has been gracious. And uh, Kevin, uh, bringing in other technologies that you're using and also talking about your process has really kind of informed us of you know different unique ways that both you guys are utilizing this and helping uh, us have that conversation. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for participating in this uh, and have a great day. And uh, after this, there's gonna be a short uh, questionnaire. Uh, we would very much appreciate it if you filled it out. Have a great day.